Thank you very much and a big thanks to the Society for awarding me the prize and for Yakult to sponsoring it. Uh, it was a great pleasure and honour to be awarded this <coughs> prize. So I work as a research associate and project manager at the um, University of Edinburgh School of Clinical Sciences and I'm also the founder of a consultancy in science communication, Science Boutique. Um, so science communication, who cares? Well, we should care because research is big and indeed in the UK over a quarter of a million people are um, working as researchers um, as was shown in this report by the Department for Business and Innovation Skills uh, with the UK uh, down here. If you look at it in another way, which was done by the um, Science Council, uh, you look across the board at um, uh, the UK economy and society as a whole, uh, up to six million people actually are involved uh, in science and this number is fastly increasing. They also calculated that about 20% of the UK, UK workforce uh, depends on science skills to do their job. <coughs> that means science progresses fast and furious. That also means that the public needs to keep up so we need to inform them. We need to tell them what's going on in those fancy or maybe not so fancy research institutes that we like to hide in. Um, we have to tell them what we're doing and also how we are doing things. Um, equally, we have to tell them maybe why we're doing certain things um, uh, in the way we're doing it. For instance, uh, topics like animal research and maybe even have to explain why we can't do certain things that may be very important but we can't do yet. Um, because otherwise they start filling in the gaps themselves and um, might come up with really crazy explanations for certain things. Also, uh, of course, there is a lot of information out there. The public uh, can get the information from the World Wide Web and other types of media. And unfortunately, this information is not also always correct. Uh, that's partly due because journalists may not understand uh, the research behind uh, uh, the reports. Uh, it's due in part because we as researchers fail to communicate the importance um, of the research and how we came to those conclusions. And also we have to keep in mind that obviously the media is there to make money. So it's better to sell your papers with catchy and maybe frightening headlines. Um, this also leads uh, to a big problem, which is um, expectations. They might be too high, and especially in patients' groups, they might think that a miracle cure is around the corner, which is nicely illustrated here um, in a, um, a report by the Euro Stem Cell about stem cell research. Uh, of course, we already know a lot about stem cell research, but we, there is still a lot that we do not know, and we have to also tell the public that for a lot of diseases, the miracle cure is not round the corner yet. Um, so it's not very helpful if the media would be uh, reporting in a hopeful way uh, rather than just helpful. On the other hand, we also have to be, be aware of uh, expectations might be too low because then they would not support certain types of research that we feel is really important. So we really have to inf inform the public of what's going on and what can be realistically expected in the near future and further future. Um, misconceptions based on misinformation from the uh, media uh, can also um, make it really hard for the public to form their own opinions and have them engage in useful discussions about the ethics um, which will then uh, obstruct um, our future research. So I would argue we all have to engage with the wider audiences. That means we have to teach them what we're doing and what we think um, should be happening but we also should listen to them and only that way we can break barriers between us with the white coats and the wider public uh, whose money we are basically using to do our job. Um, we have to get the public involved and on board so that we can uh, expect their support uh, for our continued careers. And we should discuss the benefits of what we're doing. Um, and like I say, that so that they can expect certain outcomes and know when to expect these. 
so that in the end we can actually have a dialogue with the public rather than just uh, a one-way direction. That requires some skills. Uh, it's a different target audience from the normal audience that we're speaking to at conferences like these. Uh, you have to take into account the age of the audience. You have to catch their imagination. It's harder work because you have to explain what you're doing and why you're doing and why they should care. Um, so you should keep simple, uh, use simple language, but obviously you should not be dumbing down what you're doing. Um, and you should not be afraid to show that research is not black and white and that there are actually a lot of shades of grey and hopefully that will not be paralysing for your audience. Of course, it comes at a price uh, to be involved in science communication as a researcher because it costs time and money and both of these are very precious for us. There's loads of deadlines that we have to meet, we have to publish, we have to write grants, there's uh, very strict deadlines and on top of that we have uh, to run our labs and make sure the research is um, sm uh, running smoothly. Um, so is it worth it? Is there enough recognition? Uh, what, what are the gains? Well, I would argue there are loads of gains at different levels. Firstly, obviously, the public. Uh, the more they know about it, the more enthusiastic they are about uh, what we're doing, uh, the more supportive. Um, also, the funding bodies uh, should appreciate us doing public engagement. And they are there on the behalf of the public. So if we communicate back what we're actually doing with the money and how we can help the society, uh, that's, a, if, uh, that's of immense value. Um, but what I find very um, important as well is that it is very um, good for yourself. Um, by doing public engagement you learn to communicate your, uh, your research at a different level and it really forces you to think about what you're doing. Um, you get questions that as a researcher you might actually not think about anymore because we're really, really diving into the nitty gritty of certain things and you have to take a step back and think about the bigger picture. Um, that also um, implies that you might get new ideas for certain research uh, and have to think of, of new approaches and that uh, then also benefits not only yourself but also your group and your institutes. So the second half of my talk I'll show you some of the projects I've been involved in the last few years uh, which involve um, um, developing a card game visiting primary schools and science festivals and uh, last week even a music festival. So particularly interesting and um, rewarding project um, was developing a card game. I was awarded a Beltane Fellowship um, to take time away <laughs> from the uh, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, um, um, from the lab because like I, I mentioned before it costs time and money so how can you combine it so this fellowship was designed to pay a salary for researchers to, to work one day a week for half a year on a science communication project and I wanted to design a game to help biology uh, teaching and I wanted to keep it low-tech so that there wouldn't be any hurdles like computer access or computer skills. So I chose for an old-fashioned card game. And this is to be played as a happy families game, where you pair um, families of different infectious diseases, uh, the pathogen, the route of infection, uh, symptoms, and then uh, prevention and treatment. And uh, I wanted to make sure that it would work. So I went to a school and had a focus group um, 10 year old, 12 year old kids and they had feedback which was very useful which I then used to design the cards in such a way that they actually liked playing with them. So the main audience was the 8 to 20, uh, 12 year old uh, children and when I had, had this prototype finished I got the um, BSI, the British Society for Immunology on board to print thousands of packs which they are now using for their outreach programme, visiting schools, science museums, um, science um, festivals and the like. Um, and they, they're very useful in schools, the feedback that I guess. So I've been to primary schools to talk about this card game and infectious diseases. I've also implemented a competition to get the kids to help me with the design of the cards, the logo, the tagline, so a lot of 
input from the kids is actually ending up in, in the final product. And I was amazed by the entries I got, uh, which I made into posters, you can see here. Uh, I got over 100 entries from this one school and I used a lot of their th um, ideas. I also contributed to career days to tell about what it's like to be a biologist and how you do become one. Um, I've also contributed to fi uh, science festivals. Every year over the Easter holiday uh, we have the Edinburgh International Science Festival and the Edinburgh University uh, participates with a Discover Science and I have managed two interactive stalls, Germatech and Flu Fighters, uh, to educate the uh, public about pathogens and how we can prevent um, uh, ourselves from getting ill. For that I trained about 16 colleagues, junior postdocs, uh, PhD students who helped me develop the hands-on activities as well as manning the stall. And over those uh, six days we had over 5,000 visitors, uh, mainly children and adults. At the Edinburgh International Science Festival 2010, I collaborated with Dr. Bunhead, uh, you may know him from television, uh, and we devised a Sock the Scientist quiz where we were literally being thrown questions from the audience and we had to answer on the spot uh, using props that were available. And the audience was mainly young adults who actually had to pay to come in and we were sold out. And it was a really nice way of communicating science and um, we got all kinds of questions. And again, just to highlight, you really have to think on your feet and you get all kinds of questions that you're not thinking about maybe normally, and which you can then take back to your research. I also became involved in GLOW Scotland. Um, Dr. Cathy Southworth of the Edinburgh University had devised a, a project, Too Hot to Handle, uh, to help teachers in Scotland uh, with the new curriculum uh, for excellence. And it was about linking the scientists in their labs with the pupils of the schools, uh, with a special emphasis on schools in more remote areas like the Highlands and the Islands. So we produced some videos about, about our work, uh, which could then be used in the classes. And I was uh, part of I was part of team um, um, flu fighters. And uh, just to show you, it's actually a small world. This is Marion Killip um, here, who won the Microbiologist Prize last year. I noticed. So there you go. So we were at the, at the final stage of this project, we were linked live with over 30 schools with multiple classes uh, attendance, and again we were, had to answer live questions from children, um, the main audience of which was pupils of P6 through to a secondary third. And like I mentioned two weeks ago, I was at a music festival, Green Men, in Wales and as part of the music festival they have a garden which is called uh, Einstein's Garden and there were about 15 stalls about science and I was helping out um, Gemma and Vicky from the MRC Centre for Reproductive Health at our in university uh, with what was called the egg and sperm race um, to discuss some aspects of uh, human reproductive health and there was a big surprise element because this audience came there mainly to be entertained by music and then there were some scientists trying to explain them about egg and sperm. Um, that also meant that we reached new audiences, people who would normally not come to science museums who may have never been to a science festival, especially teenagers, which is obviously a really good target audience for this kind of message because uh, we were explaining um, how the eggs, uh, how the, the, the sperm, which was uh, on little trains had to go through the uh, uterus uh, to uh, the fallopian tubes which contained the egg and then on its way had to battle through uh, vaginal mucus and immune cells to keep the uterus clean and depending on the age of the audience we threw some chlamydia in the mix as well to explain that the, how that would affect everything and that might lead to ectopic uh, um, pregnancies and the like. So. Um, it was really fun to do and it was really useful. Over those four days we had 1500, over 1,500 visitors and the, the, the feedback we got was immense. So uh, I hope you, I've inspired you to do uh, some science communication and get involved in it and get out to the public. Um, and if you would like to uh, 
chat with me about uh, where do I start. I can point you into the direction of some very useful websites. Um, uh, RC UK, uh, research councils, uh, the NCCPE, they've all now uh, become aware of the importance of science communications and there's a lot of tools out there on the web. They're very supportive, they're grants to do this kind of thing and it will help your career even though it might take your time and weekends. So finally, a big thank you to you guys for listening and again to the Society for Microbiology and Yakult for awarding me the prize. And just as a reminder, as Albert Einstein said, most of the fundamental ideas of science are essentially simple and may, as a rule, be expressed in a language comprehensible to everyone. Thank you.